From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Right now we are seeing red deep in NASDAQ futures down six tenths of a percent. We will get you into the countdown. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. We begin with the big issue, the peak debate taking hold. A look at inflation expectations. The inflation expectations. Consumer uh, inflation expectations are dropping. Inflation expectations and break-even inflation rates starting to come down from their highs. Probably 100 basis points is not necessary. We are at an important inflection point in the inflation story. If we reach peak inflation, uh, what does that really tell us? We're going to see inflation decline, but to what level? Does it mean it's really going to fall down to that 2% target that, that, that the Fed is looking for? Because the forecast in the Fed to say that they're at neutral. The labor market right now is very strong. Inflation is very high. It makes the notion that we are at neutral comical. That's a 2% inflation rate. I find that hard to, to achieve. We're still experiencing this inflation surge. Joining us now, Invesco's Kevin Holt and Piper Sandler's Michael Kantrowitz. The key question, is peak inflation, the new inflation is transitory. Is this a mirage? Kevin, I'd love to start with you. What is the market's reaction if we do get an upside surprise tomorrow to that CPI print? Yeah, I think I, I think the market's been pretty uh, optimistic in terms of um, you know CPI rolling over here, particularly with energy prices and what happened over the last 30 days. So, I think if we get an upside surprise, um, I think you're likely to see a, um, a decent uh, decent sell-off as it becomes I think more apparent to investors that the Fed's going to be here for a little bit longer and raise rates a little bit higher than what maybe the market's been anticipating maybe the last probably four weeks. Michael, do you think that that's the balance of risks right now, especially after all of the expectation for a Fed pivot? Yeah, the market is up quite a bit in the last two months, I think entirely off of the view that inflation's peaking, given that interest rates have declined, oil is down, and Fed expectations have come in a little bit. So, yeah, I think the risk is to the, that the markets get disappointed, given how much it's run up in the last two, uh, two months. Michael, where do you expect the biggest sell-off if there is an upside surprise? Um, it's going to be in those interest rate sensitive stocks, probably those growthy stocks that don't have any earnings that have, you know, were down 70, 80 percent earlier this year now have bounced 20, 30, 40 percent or more. Those are the names I think that are most at risk, the poorest fundamentals. Kevin, what about the balance of risks on the other side? If you do get a bigger disinflationary uh, print than we've been expecting, what's the likely read through? Do you think it will have any uh, effect or do you think that people are fully positioned for that reality? I mean, I, I personally think people are fully positioned and it's uh, over the last week you've seen a number of publications come out. Uh, just, you know, pointing out some of the inconsistencies in the energy data that we've seen over the last four weeks, um, where it says the energy consumption uh, in the U.S. is down versus 2020 when we were all locked down over the rolling four-week average. So uh, I think I think the market's kind of seen through this. I think we're going to get some revisions in the next two or three weeks on energy uh, of upward demand. So I think the market's a little bit ahead of this. So I think it'll be, a sell, frankly, a sell in the news or just kind of moderate uh, reaction because it's already anticipated. That's the very near term. Michael, I got to be honest, you had a pretty bold statement in your latest projection. You said it's time to prepare your portfolio for the next bear market, one led by earnings and employment. It's coming and it's going to be ugly. Can you dovetail this idea of a faster than expected rate of inflation, the jobs report that we got on Friday, and this really bearish outlook over the next few months? Yeah, well, the outlook's really over the next several uh, few quarters. You know, we've had a huge uh, shock in, in inflation and in interest rates uh, really across the board uh, and it's things we haven't seen in, in decades. And, and so while the market's been very focused on that, I think we're, investors are going to be increasingly focused on the economic implications of rising interest rates and rising commodity prices that always have a very long lagged effect on the economy. So the first six months of this year, we had a bear market due to higher rates pushing down multiples. Over the next 12 to 15 months, we're going to see the implications of those higher rates on earnings, profitability, mm. employment, 
And um, that's the typical bear market that we're used to, where earnings expectations are coming down and unemployment claims are rising. And I think that's going to be the big story, not inflation, over the next 12 months. This has been one of the distinguishing features between the bulls and the bears. The bear is seeing the Fed having to take more action in the face of some of the strong data. Uh, Citigroup's Andrew Hollenhorst expecting inflation to continue driving Fed hikes. He writes the following. Our base case remains for a 75 basis point hike in September, but we would not be too surprised by a 100 basis point hike if core inflation comes in stronger than expected. Kevin, do you agree? Is this basically uh, the likelihood that you're also tracking in your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. I mean, wage inflation, we've already seen the job data last week. Um, job data continues to be very strong. Wage inflation is not going away. Rents continue to be very strong. Food inflation, particularly with this, you know, the ongoing conflict with Russia and Ukraine, continue to be at very high levels. And as I said, oil prices, even though they're down a bit, and I think personally they're going to bounce a little bit higher, um, but I don't think it's going to get a lot better so if inflation goes from 9% to 8.5%, is that really a victory? I, I would say no, and I think the Fed's going to have to react. A lot of bearishness ahead of that uh, inflation read that we get uh, tomorrow, the CPI coming out, the latest read on inflation. In America, we are tracking all of the data points. Economists expecting a headline CPI to cool modestly with forecasts at 8.7 percent. How much does this really dictate the path forward for the Federal Reserve? And Bloomberg's Michael McKee has been tracking all this. Mike, what are you looking for tomorrow? Well, it's kind of interesting because over the last couple of days, Lisa, we've seen some people on Wall Street start to worry about a higher expected print for CPI than forecast by the Bloomberg economists. And the reason being this uh, Cleveland Fed inflation now cast, you can see the white line there, ran below the actual CPI print for uh, some weeks in a row. And then it is now above it. But it's at 8.8 percent. The forecast is 8.7 percent. Does that really matter uh, a tenth of a percentage point in this environment? It seems to. Uh, the Fed, as you saw from that uh, Jay Powell uh, quote, is looking for compelling evidence. That's the word they use, that inflation is falling. And today, uh, you're going to have to look for, or tomorrow, rather, you're going to have to look for the month over month uh, to see if there's evidence it's falling, because the year over years are distorted by base effects. CPI month over month expected to tick down to two-tenths from 1.3 percent, and the core five-tenths from 0 0.7 percent. Now, that would bring down CPI year over year to 8.7 percent, the uh, forecast, the consensus forecast, and the core would go up because of base effects to 6.1 percent. So let's see what happens tomorrow. Whether it affects the Fed or not in this whole 1 percent, 75 basis point uh, move thing is going to depend more on inflation expectations probably than actual inflation if inflation comes in as forecast. And you can see what happened yesterday. The white and the blue lines there are those New York Fed anticipated inflation levels for one and three years ahead. The other two are the University of Michigan's. We get those on Friday. But basically over the last month, Month, we've seen a drop, primarily probably because of the gasoline price fall. But if people are still hanging in there on inflation and not pushing expectations higher, that gives the Fed some comfort that they haven't lost control of inflation yet. Mike, thank you so much for that. A lot of muddying signals as we look through the different now casts and then that New York Fed survey of inflation expectations. Michael, you've been talking about that bearish view about uh, what you expect in the quarters to come. What does that mean when it comes to oil, given how much it's come off the, uh, the, the highs that we've seen in the past few months? So, yeah, the good news is that oil's come down, and we'll probably see that reflected in a better Michigan uh, sentiment that's much more sensitive to uh, gas prices and oil prices, where confidence, uh, the other consumer confidence survey is more tied to the job market. So it's, it's good news that uh, it's obviously good news that gas prices are coming down. The bad news is that food and energy inflation uh, it was the last print was 22 percent, uh, the highest since 1974, the second highest on record. And any time in the past when the Fed's been raising rates and food and energy inflation has been above 5 percent, uh, that's been the, the historical track record right before a recession. So in my mind, you know, those two, that combination uh, puts extremely high odds in a recession. And ultimately, I think we're going to see the impact of that as claims start to rise over the next 
uh, or they have been rising, but continue to rise over the next several months. And I think investors will be focused on claims as much as they're focused on inflation today. Just to put a bow on this, Michael, are you uh, shedding oil and exposure energy <laughs> stocks? Are you basically leaning into this saying it's more signal than noise? Uh, yeah, I think you know the easy money has been made within the energy sector. At this point, the risk reward are much more balanced. And historically, when investors really start to latch on to the deterioration of the job market, specifically with unemployment claims, oil tends to go down and really struggle to go up. So, I, you know, obviously the supply issues there are keeping many people bullish. And so we've moved it down to a market weight. Uh, we think given the drawdown we've already seen and the timing of when we expect claims to really spook investors really more in the fourth quarter, we think there's a couple months here where, where energy stocks can still market perform. Kevin, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, so we, we kind of look at what's discounted into the stocks at this point. So I mean, honestly, eight, 10 weeks ago, we were unloading stocks pretty aggressively uh, within the energy space because they were just counting $75 oil. We would argue today with the pullback, dramatic pullback in a very short period of time, they're discounting 58 to 60 again. So with our mid-cycle pricing, assuming 75, <clears throat> um, we've actually started to incrementally add back here in the last week or so after this dramatic pullback, because we do think supply is different. We think the incentive systems for management teams are different. So although you do have some demand headwinds, listening last week to some of the downstream companies, Marathon Petroleum, Valero, they have not seen the demand downtick that we've seen in the data. So again, we're, we're trying to follow the data from a bottom-up basis. So Kevin, just to sort of put a bow on that, do you think that this is more noise than <clears throat> signal with respect to how much oil prices have come down? Um, I think uh, it, it's always hard to discount that. But yeah, I think there was such a big premium because of Russia, Ukraine, that Russia oil is finding a home in India and China. So I think that's some of it, but I do think <clears throat> probably two thirds of it is noise um, just around demand. Um, I mean, I'm more concerned about emerging markets demand with the strength of the dollar than I am continued strong demand in the U.S. at this point. We will uh, dig into that coming up. Kevin Holtz and Michael Kantrowitz, both of you are sticking with us right now. We want to take a look at some of the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell. Abby, go do a little here. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, you know, it's interesting because we have the futures down modestly, but we have a few movers that are down sharply. You think that they would weigh more, at least on sentiment. I'm talking about Micron, the chip maker. It's down more than 4%. This after they pre-announced the downside. That was the case with NVIDIA yesterday, different types of chip companies. Micron focuses on NAND and DRAM forms of storage. But the common denominator is Micron is talking about the weakness being a demand issue, not supply. And speaking of demand, and we see that NVIDIA down sharply for a second day. Speaking of demand, though, Norwegian Cruise Lines, they put up a worse quarter than expected, a wider loss. But even more worrying is the fact that they cut guidance. And it seems that it has to do with consumer discretionary spending, not having the money. That stock down 8 percent. And then finally, the biggest laggard on the day, Novavax. Uh, the stock is plunging, clearly. They put up a huge miss in the last quarter. They also lowered the outlook. Both Jeffries and Cowan have cut their price targets on the share. Cowan saying that they are frustrated with management once again. That stock does have a 19 percent bearish short interest, those shorts vindicated today, Lisa, clearly. Abigail, thank you so much. We will be speaking with the Micron CEO coming up in just about 15 minutes time. Also coming up, President Biden taking a victory lap. A whole range of things that are really game changers for ordinary folks. Now, some of it's not going to kick in for a little bit, but it's all good. That conversation is still ahead. We are seeing declines uh, across the board here in the equity space as we chart toward that CPI print tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. I think that he's in a fragile place. He's uh, his. Uh, he has problems with his economy. He, he's acting like a, a scared bully. And this is hit what, before the, uh, the meeting that where he will want to be reelected. That was how Speaker Nancy Pelosi reacted to China's response after her Taiwan trip, also saying that she had a majority support to go to Taiwan. This comes as President Biden prepares to sign the CHIPS Act into law aimed at countering China and semiconductor manufacturing capacity. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew joining us now from Washington, D.C., and we are about 15 minutes, a little bit less, away from speaking with Micron's CEO uh, on the Hill as he goes to that. How significant is this chip bill? How quickly can it bring production online in the United States? States. 
Well, that's a great question because this is a long range plan to be clear here, Lisa. We're talking about many months, in fact, years it takes to get foundries up and running, but it's already prompted companies like Intel and Samsung to make major investments. Intel in Ohio, Samsung in Texas, and that was the refrain from the White House. If they didn't get this done, financial incentives from other countries might undo this whole idea of boosting domestic manufacturing of chips. To your point, though, this is it. The president signs it today. It, it, it passed last month after taking months to get done here with some Republican support. And today, you'll see the president sign this with quite a collection of CEOs, not only chip makers, but also interesting to note the CEO of Lockheed Martin will be there, which reminds us of that 11th hour pitch that Gina Raimondo made, the Commerce Secretary, that this is not just about your home computer or your washing machine. This is a national security problem. It's a major issue and would hold us back, potentially, if we lost access to chips from Taiwan, for instance, from making more military hardware. Yeah, there are chips basically in your flower uh, plants at this point. At some point, mm -hmm. though, uh, there is a discussion in Washington, D.C., that is much more driven by the sensational. How much are people talking about chips in D.C.? How much are people talking about the search of Mar-a-Lago of Donald Trump? Well, it's a, it's a difficult bit of timing here. As I mentioned, the bill passed last month. They wanted to hold on at the White House and do it on a day like today so the president could be out there in the sun talking about this and making good with CEOs. But indeed, uh, the search of Mar-a-Lago last night has changed the narrative everywhere in the world of politics. It's going to be difficult for the White House to, to get through uh, to the lead story today as we have an unprecedented situation here. And there's very little that we know about it. So many questions to answer. As Donald Trump let us know yesterday, Yesterday, the FBI, in fact, did serve a search warrant that's never happened before for a president or a former president. And we still don't know exactly what they were looking for after a months long effort to, to get back documents and some other items from the White House that Donald Trump sent to Mar-a-Lago upon his departure. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And don't miss our interview with Micron CEO Sanjay Meroda. He's coming up at the opening bell here. Kevin Holt and Michael Kanchowitz back with us. And the political discussion really goes to what the fiscal response could be to a potential downturn. Kevin, how much are you weighing the midterm elections into uh, your fiscal response and the way that you built it into your market expectation? <clears throat> yeah, so, so we're we you know I try to I try to take a longer term view when I'm making my investments. So um, any you know one thing about politics is it's not predictable. <laughs> so we try to uh, we try to kind of cut that out as much as possible. But I do think the American public has realized we've probably stimulated as much as we possibly can. So I think when you factor that into your analysis, um, <clears throat> I don't think the, the the fiscal policy and or the Fed are going to come to the rescue um, just because I think they're 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 kind of done what they can at this point. But, Michael, to that point, and, and Kevin raises a really good issue here, which is there isn't going to be the will to necessarily have a fiscal response to the bear market that you are expecting. How does that factor into what you see as the duration, the depth as you prepare? Yeah, well, the, the duration of this downturn is going to be uh, a function of how much tightening precedes it. And, you know, while oil prices are down, uh, central banks around the world are still tightening uh, interest rates and raising short term rates. So there's still a, a long uh, lag uh, from when we're going to see that actually show up in the economy. In fact, we think most of what the Fed has done this year won't even show up in the economic data and earnings data until next year. Uh, there's a long and variable lag. So the, by the time we get there, um, you know, given that we currently today have high inflation, so in the immediate term, there's very low odds, if, if, if they're even above zero, of any kind of stimulus, whether it's from monetary policy or from D.C. And given the amount of debt we have, given the experience we just went through with all the stimulus and what that led to, uh, it is difficult to see any uh, stimulus coming without a, a real big drop in the economy. Uh, and 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 so you know we're not expecting an 08 like uh, backdrop, but we do uh, anticipate a, a pretty healthy recession, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a good way. Yeah, that's what uh, some people are saying on the bearish side. Wells Fargo's Chris Harvey, though, trying to parse through some of the details in the recent legislation, writing about the tax imp impact on com corporate America, saying, "quote With the buyback tax not going into effect until next year, it could cause some companies to accelerate buybacks into the second half of 2022." A small net positive positive to 2023 EPS. Kevin, how much does this ring true to you at a time when people would all ultimately think that a tax on buybacks would be a negative, that it ends up being a positive because of the front loading that could happen? 
<clears throat> yeah, so I guess, as you said, short term, it could be some front loading. I do think it, it does, and we've actually we, we reflected in some of our models over the last uh, just the last few days, and that it does take certain companies that uh, are going to be buying back stock less, and what the accretion of that is, and we can argue whether that's fair or not. Um, but it does affect kind of the longer term value, which is where most of the value are in stocks, not short term. So, it, yeah, it may prop up things short term, but it's definitely a, it's a negative economic consequence uh, to the stock market over any ex any extended period of time. Michael, before we go, since you have been pretty bearish, I'm wondering what your cash holding is like and how it's changed over the past few months. Sure. You know, as we came into this year, we started really at the peak of the business cycle in, in, in the terms of leading indicators, and everyone was very focused on interest rates. So as I said earlier, we've had a bear market already from the spike in interest rates, and now we've had a rally in the last two months if some of those fears have, have come off the oil. <coughs> Going forward, though, we're going to see the economic consequences uh, of, of all this tightening that's going on around the world, which, which again, takes several quarters to show up. So we think the depth of this downturn is going to be sometime in the middle of next year. That's where economic data and earnings data and employment data will be at its worst. So we have incrementally uh, pushed up our defensive recommendations, whether it's cash, treasuries, or more counter-cyclical sectors like staples and utilities. In fact, yesterday, uh, we literally just upgraded those defensive sectors. Uh, I really think there's limited upside from the market here and a whole lot of downside from this lagged effect of rising inflation, interest rates, commodities, uh, and really, you know, everything. Kevin Holt, Michael Kantrowitz, thank you both so much for being with us. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Micron warning investors of a challenging market ahead as President Biden prepares to sign the CHIPS bill into law. More on that still ahead. This is Bloomberg. First up, Bear downgrading Bed Bath & Beyond to underperform, citing accelerating losses and calling its recent rally the latest meme stock frenzy. Next up, Deutsche Bank cutting Palantir to sell with an $8 price target, seeing little support for a positive picture after earnings. And finally, Susquehanna lowering its price target on NVIDIA to $210, expecting the company's weakness to continue in the second half. Coming up, we're going to be talking with the head of Micron. This is Bloomberg. Countdown to the open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading with a soggy start to the day. Losses ahead of the open. NASDAQ uh, positioned to be down about seven tenths of a percent. Uh, Russell 2000, four tenths of a percent. The S&P 4133 down to tenths of a percent. And this comes as the front end of the yield curve continues to see gains. You see the yields uh, rise and you see an inversion continue to the deepest going back to 2046 basis points as we do get uh, 10 year yields go slightly up, but not nearly as much as those two-year yields. A bit of dollar weakness, uh, but pretty much meandering around here with Euro 102.40. And crude higher after uh, the reports that a Russian pipeline into Europe uh, was curtailing some of its output. What does that mean in terms of the outlook heading into the winter over in Europe? Joining us now with a look at the stocks moving at the opening bell, here's Abigail Doolittle. Well, Lisa, it's interesting. You're talking about the U.S. futures just a little bit soggy or the index is opening a little bit soggy, but real underperformance from the Stocks right now down 2.6% or 2.4% off of its real lows, but un in any case, really underperforming on weakness from NVIDIA and Micron. Of course, we've had two pre announcements to the downside in two days on demand, and I know that you'll be speaking with Micron CEO very shortly. Signet also lowered this as the K Jeweler and Zales owner cuts their revenue forecast on a consumer pullback, so that seems to be a theme. They've also bought Blue Nile, the internet jewelry store, for $360 million. To the upside, though, we do have have oil back above $90 per barrel. That's helping out uh, ExxonMobil up 2%. And then finally, uh, Boeing had been lower, excuse me, higher earlier. It's right now flipping uh, just slightly lower. This, of course, as the 787 Dreamliner delivery has received an OK from the FAA, set to resume deliveries this week, maybe as early as tomorrow, Lisa. Thank you so much, Abigail. Micron lowering its fourth quarter revenue forecast and weakening demand. The company saying bit shipments will decline causing revenue and margins to follow. Let's bring in Kaylee Lines who's been covering all of this. Kaylee, uh, what do you see? 
Well, I see the stock down about 3% now at the opening bell, Lisa. And of course, as Abigail mentioned, it's really taking the semiconductor complex down with it. Almost every single stock within the SOX index, the Philly Semiconductor Index, is down on the day. You also have the likes of AMD and Taiwan Semiconductor down by a little more than 2%. NVIDIA is actually down about 9.6%. And as you said, Micron coming out saying fourth quarter sales may come in light at the low end or even below its previous guidance with significant sequ sequential declines in revenue and margin. The reason why is the company saying the environment is just challenging both this quarter and in the next one with macroeconomic factors and supply constraints leading to a broadening of consumer inventory adjustments. So basically the demand environment for certain products is weakening. It renews concerns about a slowdown specifically in computer and smartphones that memory uh, that Micron makes memory chips for. So the idea that consumers aren't spending as much on electronic devices as they spend much more on everything else and specifically on necessities. In a separate piece of news, though, the company did say that it will use anticipated government grants and credits from the CHIPS Act just passed that the president will be speaking on later today to invest $40 billion in the U.S. by 2030, really trying to build out manufacturing capacity here in the United States, because as it stands right now, at least estimated through the end of 2023, not a lot of memory fabs uh, our capacity is here, only about 10 percent. The bulk of it is in China and Taiwan, and we know that is obviously an area of sensitivity right now, Lisa. Kaylee Lyons, thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to say that Chief Executive Officer Sanjay Virotra of Micron joining us now from the White House in the heels of that announcement of investing $40 billion through the decade uh, to get more production into the U.S. Can you give us a sense, San, uh, Sanjay, of how quickly uh, the, the production of these chips could be diverted to the United States and it could become a majority of the output? So this will be really for 2025, 2026, start of production here in the U.S. With these $40 billion through this decade that Micron has committed to be investing, it will enable us to meet the growing demand for memory that is anticipated for this decade. Uh, memory is expected to grow faster than the rest of the semiconductor industry, and memory consumption is expected to double by the end of this decade. And we will need more wafer capacity in order to supply that demand. So I'm really pleased, and on behalf of the 45,000 team members of Micron, to be here today as President Biden signs this CHIPS and science legislation that really solidifies long-term technology and manufacturing leadership of America. And Micron is pleased to be playing an important role with commitment of $40 billion of investment, which will bring 40,000 jobs, including 5,000 direct jobs at Micron, and another 35,000 jobs in construction, support, services with suppliers and in the community. And of course, this is the largest investment in semiconductor many memory manufacturing here in the US. This will be made over the course of the decade bringing our supply online with the industry demand trends as well. So yes, I mean, today, less than one in 50 chips in the memory chips in the world are produced here in U.S. With Micron's commitment, it will enable us to produce one in 10 chips of the global memory consumption here in the U.S. So this is really major moving of the needle in terms of securing domestic supply chain and, of course, uh, enabling national and economic security as well. How and much, Micron is pleased to be part of this. Sanjay, how much was this in the works even before the CHIPS bill was signed uh, into law? So what I can tell you is that the 2% of the global memory production that's taking place here in the U.S. today would have gone way down if it was not for CHIPS incentives and grants. Because we have to be having a level playing field with foreign countries where the foreign governments have been providing incentives yeah. over the last couple of decades, and that's why so much production has moved overseas. So this incentive now is needed to reverse that trend from 2% becoming even smaller to now taking it to 10%. That means 1 in 10 chips being produced here. So our investment would have been far, far less if the chips and science legislation would not have been in place here in the U.S. We would have produced more overseas. So we Sanjay are very pleased 
that we are being we are able to be part of U.S. resilient domestic supply chain going forward. Sanjay, this comes at a tenuous time in the economy, very hard to gauge where things are going. Earlier this morning, uh, Micron put out a statement, as you know, uh, downgrading the forecast for the rest of the year's revenue. What went wrong in terms of areas that there has been less demand for than expected? So again, you know, we have to manage the business for the near term as well as for the longer term. Some of the investments that I just discussed here are really looking at long-term opportunity of increasing memory and storage. Everything is becoming about data and efficiencies that data is driving in businesses and consumers' life. So we have to be able to supply that growth in memory over time through the investments that we just discussed. In the near term, due to the macroeconomic uncertainties as well as due to high levels of inventories that customers have built across various end market segments for us, those inventories ha are being adjusted down, and that is what is resulting in reduced demand for us. So compared to our last earnings call, we have seen further weakening in the industry demand trends, primarily because of inventory adjustments broadening outside of just consumer to other parts of the markets, including cloud, including data center, and uh, industrial and automotive as well. So as these inventories at customers as well as at suppliers get balanced over time, then the industry demand health will return, we think, sometime in the next year. And we are, important thing is, we are taking action to cut supply growth in the near term to restore the health of the industry. So in the, in the near term, yes, we are reducing our capex to prudently manage our supply growth and bring demand and supply in line. And of course, the, that will have to be done in the industry as well. And in the longer term, the secular demand trends are intact, they are healthy, yeah. and that's what is giving us confidence, along with Micron's execution continuing to be solid in technology leadership, manufacturing yeah. excellence, product momentum, and customer relationships. Sanjay, I know you have to go meet with President Biden, and I, we only have one minute left, but I want to get your sense about reducing supply ahead of what you expect to be reduced demand. How do you avoid this whipsaw of a complete lack and shortage to a glut? So I think what's important is that there will be cycles in our industry. But if you look at across the cycles, just look at last five years, across the cycle, Micron actually strengthened its revenue and strengthened its profitability. We remain very committed to the financial model that we had discussed at our investor conference in May in terms of a cross cycle, continuing to deliver the revenue growth, profitability, and of course, free cash flow capability. So yes, we will always manage the business through the cycles, but across the cycles, because of increasing demand for memory and storage and microns, continuing solid execution on all fronts, we are confident in the long-term business opportunities for our industry, and certainly for Micron. Sanjay Mehrotra, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Micron's chief executive officer on the heels of a pretty significant investment in what we are seeing in terms of the chip sector and development in the United States. Right now, it is a pleasure to get some comments from Wei Li uh, of BlackRock, who has been managing the global invest in institutional investment uh, policies there. And I have to just quickly get a comment from you, uh, Wei, on this whole chip sector and the pain that we've been seeing in some of these semiconductors. How much of a signal is that in terms of falling off demand for high income items like smartphones, like personal computers? I think this speaks to um, a continuation of uh, the trend uh, of uh, reshoring, friendshoring that has uh, its roots uh, way before the pandemic. You know, even back during the during the trade wars, and it paints a direction of travel going forward as well. And we have to be very, very cognizant in terms of what this means for longer term uh, inflation uh, cost uh, of uh, production, and we have to consider that as as we think about as allocation as well. Well, I know that you've been pretty bearish uh, over the past couple of weeks and months, basically saying stocks are looking less and less attractive and seeing value at investment grade credit instead. What's the idea behind this? What's making you so concerned at a time when we see resilience in earnings? We saw a labor market report that absolutely blew expectations out of the water on Friday. 
Um, that's absolutely right. We had a very, very hot labor market uh, report. And just for context, through the course of this year, we have been lowering our portfolio level uh, risk taking, uh, incrementally decreasing our conviction towards equities and incrementally increasing uh, our conviction towards uh, uh, credit and currently have a up in quality bias in terms of our portfolio uh, construction. And the reason that we're somewhat uh, uh, cautious in terms of uh, the outlook for equities as, uh, at this particular juncture, especially after the recent uh, bear market uh, rally, is because, number one, we believe that uh, the pricing for the dovish pivot from the Fed is too premature. We're not out of the woods with inflation uh, yet. And number two, we believe that uh, earnings expectation is too positive. Yes, we have seen earnings holding up, especially actually sales holding up better than earnings. But as we head into a slowing growth, in fact, we believe the U.S. economy is set to enter a version of recession uh, early next year and Europe entering a recession this year. And that has yet to translate into earnings recession expectations. So because of uh, the dovish uh, pricing premature and earnings uh, forecast at this juncture still too uh, optimistic, especially after you strip out energies. Uh, 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 for example, uh, we think that actually uh, staying uh, uh, prudent when we think about asset allocation is, uh, is warranted at this juncture. Wei Li, you're going to be sticking with us so we can dig into some of those comments in just a minute. Coming up, we'll also be talking about Russia halting oil flows to Central Europe. The uh, pipelines going west from Russia uh, are the critical link to energy security in Europe. Russia is willing to flex its energy muscles against Europe, and this could be a sign of that. That conversation is still ahead as we look at markets that are in the red. Uh, NASDAQ down seven tenths of a percent. S&P uh, coming back off the earlier lows down just about uh, less than two tenths of a percent. You see yields climbing price down in the bond space. This is Bloomberg. The uh, pipelines going west from Russia uh, are the critical link to energy security in Europe. And a lot of the energy security planning that's going on in Europe right now is watching this, not only for the oil story, which I, I think we'll talk about first, but also the read through to what it means for gas. Russia is willing to flex its energy muscles against Europe, and this could be a sign of that. Europe's energy security taking another hit. Russia halting crude flows to Central Europe and reversing an earlier decline in oil. Bloomberg's Julian Lee joining us now for more. Julian, how significant is this report that there was a cutoff in supply of oil from Russia to Europe on August 4th? Uh, it's very significant for the countries of Central Europe, uh, for Hungary, Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Uh, they rely very heavily on that pipeline. Um, so for them, it's, it's a big deal. And, and uh, for much of the rest of Central Europe as well, we, we've got a number of uh, problems that are all happening at the same time. Uh, the refinery near Vienna in Austria uh, is running at very low rates after an incident. Uh, the water levels on both the Rhine and the Danube are extremely low. That makes it much more difficult to uh, move product by barge up those rivers. Uh, so this is, has come at a, um, a very opportune time for President Putin, uh, perhaps no surprise there, uh, and a very difficult time for Central Europe. Julian, can you give us a sense of what this says going into the fall, going into the winter in terms of how some of these pipelines are going to be leveraged and how Europe is trying to get ahead of that as quickly as possible now? Yeah, I mean, you know, President Putin has, has shown that he's very willing to play pipeline politics with both uh, oil and gas. Um, and those are pipelines carrying Russian oil as well as pipelines carrying other people's. You only have to look at what's happened to uh, the CPC pipeline that, that carries predominantly Kazakhstani crude uh, over the last three months to see how he's prepared to drag other countries into this. Um, what I think he's, he's doing is he's putting the blame on, on the sanctions everywhere that he can. I mean, Transneft has said that this, is, this disruption has happened uh, because its Ukrainian counterpart has stopped providing transit services, so it can't pump the oil through Ukraine. Um, it says that the, the Ukrainians stopped that because yeah. the payment that the Russians made was returned. So therefore, he's, he's laying the blame for this on Europe. But he's, 
he's going to keep playing these games with oil and gas pipelines um, right up in, into and through the winter um, to keep pressure on. I mean, I think this is yeah. as much aimed at, at getting Viktor Orban to uh, raise his opposition to sanctions as anything else. Julian Lee of Bloomberg News, thank you so much for being with us. Wei Lee is still with us of BlackRock, Chief Investment Officer. And Wei, I'm wondering from your perspective, the oil story has been a real question mark recently, being whipsawed in all directions. Do you buy into this weakness? Do you just uh, want to sell as much as you can into the weakness? Or do you see this as an opportunity to buy because this will be a resilient area with all of the uncertainty that Julian was just talking about? There are a few pieces that uh, that play to this. Obviously, we have seen energy prices uh, coming down, and that's going to likely mean that tomorrow's uh, uh, headline uh, CPI is going to be lower versus uh, versus last month, and it has kind of read across to broader uh, asset uh, allocation. Although we think that, of course, it's key to focus on coal, it's key to focus on sequential. But more broadly, when it comes to uh, energy uh, investing, we would prefer to kind of access the theme through energy uh, equities, energy producers, rather than the underlying sport. Uh, commodities because of the years of underinvestment and we do think that uh, through equities is a better way to play that uh, even as we head into uh, growth uh, slowdown and again we are uh, forecasting a recession in Europe uh, this year because of the uh, oil uh, uh, crisis and then more broadly when we talk about kind of the elevated geopolitical uh, tension uh, we do think that Europe actually is uh, has been and is uh, going to take the brunt of uh, the energy crisis uh, and in fact when it comes to asset pricing European equities are not pricing in uh, full-blown gas uh, crisis uh, uh, um, but we have recently lowered our growth forecast because of the rationing energy rationing expectation as we head into well going from a very hot uh, summer to a very, very cold winter, and that is not yet reflected in equity pricing. But because of this somewhat uh, uh, gloomy growth outlook facing Europe uh, in particular, we believe that the ECD will not be able to push ahead as much as market uh, pricing suggests. And as a result of that, we are actually currently neutral European uh, government bonds were overweight guilt because uh, UK is uh, is in an even deeper uh, recession, but we're slightly underweight uh, US uh, government bonds because uh, uh, we believe term premium will come back in and the uh, dovish uh, pricing for uh, dovish pivot is uh, a bit premature. Wait, based on your idea about following kind of the easing or the potential easing or the lack of tightening of uh, central banks, what gives you conviction in U.S. investment grade credit, considering that based on the recent data, the Fed has to go a lot further, has to raise rates a lot more, which will inevitably impact investment grade credit and all fixed income? I would first contextualize our overweight uh, in investment grades in a whole portfolio sense. So we have been increasing our conviction to investment grades, but we have been decreasing our conviction to equities. And overall, collectively, that represents an up in quality adjustment to portfolios. And specifically as it relates to investment grade, I would note that credit spread actually widened versus beginning of the year. And even in the latest leg up in risk assets, equities have rallied, but the spread have not really really tightened that much, right? So when we think about relative valuation, relative uh, pricing, uh, equities have yet to price in uh, even a mild version of uh, a recession, but investment rate is uh, pricing a version of uh, growth is slowing down already. And if you think about fundamentals, corporate balance sheet is still reasonably uh, uh, robust. We're not expecting a, a mass default type of uh, uh, outlook. And if you think about the refinancing uh, a prospect and the issuance uh, technicals, they are also somewhat supportive of investment grade. But between with in credit, we prefer investment grade over high yield, again, because of this having quality preference that we have. Wait, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. Right now, we are seeing a uh, market selling off just a touch after uh, managing to eke out gains last week. Deepening losses. NASDAQ down now more than 1%. S&P down four tenths of a percent, 41.22. We do see yields just a touch higher in the front end. This is Bloomberg.
time now for the trading diary. You need to be watching this week. President Biden discussing and signing the CHIPS Act momentarily. Look at the latest read on inflation with U.S. CPI on Wednesday, U.S. PPI and another round of initial jobless claims on Thursday, and finally the UMISH sentiment survey on Friday. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.